Hi, you're very welcome to the podcast. My name is Anita Bourne and I'm the founder of The Femcast, a podcast and website driven by a passion for empowering women and promoting gender equality. Through The Femcast, we are making it our mission to educate, empower and encourage women to harness the power of their voices, share their stories and raise awareness of the crucial issues affecting women today. By amplifying women's voices, The Femcast aims to strengthen women's rights and celebrate the achievements of women everywhere. We are passionate about making a positive impact through storytelling, advocacy, and creating a supportive community to act as an inspiration to others who aspire to effect change. Come visit our website, www.thefemcast.com for more information on what we do and resources to help you. Episode of The Bully Brain we discuss the issue of abuse in relationships, particularly focusing on the abuse experienced by women. We highlight the alarming statistic that one in four women have been abused by a former or current partner. Jen talks about the connection between childhood trauma and intimate relationships, emphasizing the importance of early care and nurture in shaping one's ability to have healthy relationships. We talk about individuals who have experienced abusive or neglectful childhoods, how they may struggle with intimacy and vulnerability in relationships. Jen explains that traumatic experiences can lead to reenacting past traumas and aligning with the aggressor as a survival mechanism. We also delve into the societal factors that contribute to abusive behaviour, such as misogyny and homophobia. Hi Jen and welcome back today. How was your week? It was great. I had a wonderful week. Really busy. Brilliant. Yeah. So last week we touched on uh, the bullied brain and in schools. And this week we're going to do it in relationships. Uh, So statistically, one in four women have been abused by a current or former partner. How we look after women in those circumstances and their children. I mean, that's, that's an unbelievable statistic, really, when you think about it. But What it makes me think of instantly is if there's ever going to be a moment where you bring up childhood trauma, it's in an intimate relationship. So when we're very young and we're um, cared for by parents, that's when we, it's very sensual. You know, as a child, they dress you, they love you, they show affection, they, your, your naked body is held to theirs, et cetera. So all of those feelings, if you've been a man, let's say, a boy who was raised in a family where there maybe wasn't a lot of understanding or not a lot of care, not a lot of affection and gentleness and nurture that allowed you to develop those same qualities in yourself. If in fact you were in a home where it was abusive and maybe your mother was, I mean, she might've had a mental illness and was neglectful or distant or cold, or she might've been reenacting her own traumas. The father might've been violent. He might've been reenacting his own traumas. So imagine a boy, a little boy, a male baby in that environment. So then as he gets older and it's all no more sensual, it's clothes on at school, being in this masculine environment, we're not supposed to, boys aren't supposed to show emotion. They're supposed to repress everything. Then he falls in love with someone and all of a sudden you're back in that intimate space where again, it's sensual and you don't have your clothes on and all of a sudden your trauma comes, you know, bursting out of you. You don't even know where it's coming from and you find yourself reenacting the trauma you went through as a child, but you've aligned with the aggressor because that's how the brain survives. The brain would far rather be aggressive in that moment than vulnerable. You don't want to remember the vulnerable boy. Your society told you to repress all those feelings and don't be a crybaby and be a good soldier all your life. And so you're, you're not tapped into gentle and affection and showing care. You actually are having a panicky brain moment where all of a sudden you find yourself aggressive. And so I'm not trying to excuse or say it's okay or that these statistics aren't absolutely appalling or that women aren't in danger. I don't mean any of that. I'm simply backtracking on science to say, how can we understand this from a brain science perspective in order to bring health and well-being to the the offender, the violent person, and then the victim? Yeah, because I wondered, you know, because babies are born and they're beautiful and the mother's nurturing the boys and then they grow up to be abusers. Now, in some cases, women as well, but just 
statistically, it's more the boys and they've watched their mother suffer. So I suppose it starts with education and it starts early and it starts in school. Well, I mean, as you and I talked about Anita, like we spend so much time filling kids' heads with romance. Oh, and the wedding day. It's all about the wedding day. You put all your energy into having the perfect dress and the perfect flowers and the, the right tableware and none of that matters. I mean, it's very beautiful and it's very romantic and it's lovely, but that's not where your energy needs to go if you want to have a healthy, happy marriage. We know that statistically many marriages, like at least 50% fail. So what we need to do is educate our young people starting at, you know, 13, bef just before they're starting to enter into, um, you know, sexual and romantic relationships. We want to teach them all of the psychology and all of the brain science on okay, this is, how are you going to care for one another? How are you going to work through some of the things that might happen to you that are going to get triggered? How can you seek help? Who do you call? What is the, what is the moment that you know you need a mental health pro professional to step in and really, you know, it's, if you have a sickness in your body, you go to the doctor. If you've got something mentally ill, you go to a, a mental health professional and get support and help and, and a cure or repair recovery. So, I mean, I think that it's a big social issue that we need to address and always always education is number one yeah so um last week we talked about bully side with the schools and the children and uh, this week it, a report in the uk came back uh, about domestic abuse leading to more suicides than it does domestic homicides so there's three in Three women a week are killed, are murdered in the UK, but a coroner now has established that a lot of the suicides will bring it up to 10 women dying by suicide because they just are in fear of their life. They're worn down, they can't take anymore, and they're asking the government now to act on the link between domestic abuse and suicide. Wow, that is just a tragic statistic. That is incredible. Incredibly sad. Yeah. Three is a lot, but 10 per week now when they gathered the information from suicide and women that have left domestic violence. Yeah. It's huge. Going back to the um, education piece, we need to teach our young women that the critical thing in a relationship is not to be dependent. So you don't want to marry anybody. If you are going to be dependent on them, you don't want to have children with them. If you're going to be dependent and you don't want to marry them because you instantly in that moment, set up the conditions for them having power over you. And it's a power imbalance that leads people to feel so desperate and like there's no escape. And, you know, in research that they've done with animals, which we won't discuss in detail because it's, it's horrendous, but it's a very famous experiment because it taught us about what the researchers call learned helplessness. And what they did was, let's just pretend it's a domestic violence situation. The animal is hurt or beaten once a week, let's say on the, on the Friday. And, and then the pattern and the structure goes where, oh, I'm so sorry and it won't happen again and I'm going to be better until next Friday. So the animal is, has this established pattern. And what happens is, just as you described, it becomes so afraid and so full of despair, they no longer believe they can escape the situation. Like literally their brain says, you are trapped, you can never get away. So you open up the, the cage door and you tell the animal, free to go. You do not have to stay here. No one's going to touch you. You can go. And the animal will cower in the back of the cage. They won't leave. It's called learned helplessness. The other research phrase, and this should be taught to kids at 13 and then over and over and over again as they grow up. The other brain phrase that they use is a perception of inescapability. In other words, you believe you're trapped. And then I hope this isn't just too much information, but there's another key point that I think all we should be teaching our, our teenagers and our young women and our young men. The other thing that happens is if you're being hurt by somebody who you you are dependent on, so let's pretend you've had two kids, you're the mom staying home taking care of the children, and you depend on your husband for financial stability, and you don't have a family you can go to, or you don't have friends that you can escape to, you have this dependence. So what you do, because your brain understands, not only can you not survive without the, the person that makes the money, 
but your children can't survive without the person that makes the money. So your brain identifies with or aligns with the aggressor. So this is where you get women in a court case situation or with the police and their brain has said to them, look, if you want to survive, you need to align with the person that's that's so terrifying, that's so dangerous, that's so destructive, that's violent. If you align with them, they're less likely to hurt you or hurt your children. So you can imagine how confused the brain gets when the police come. The brain looks at them and thinks, uh-oh, they're going to come in between me and the, my captor, my aggressor, and I've identified with them. So the police are trying to separate us. I have to protect the aggressor. So you get women saying, oh, no, nothing happened. Oh, I fell down the stairs or... I want to retract my statement in court. I don't want to accuse my husband. I mean, it's just, it's so complex. It's so complex. So this is a famous experiment. Well, it wasn't an experiment. It happened in real life. I'm sure you know about this. It was in the 1970s, and they started to refer to this concept as Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah. So in Stockholm Syndrome, and as you know, I write about it in the book. In Stockholm Syndrome, there was a group of people who were bank people, bank tellers, they were um, held in a vault by two men who had guns, bank robbers, and they identified with the aggressors and they didn't want the police to intervene. Now, the reason they didn't want the police to intervene is they thought the bank robbers would shoot them on the spot and they were terrified. And so their brains identified with the aggressor. When they actually got liberated and they were free, they were so aligned with the aggressor, they felt with these bank robbers, they felt affection for them. They felt they hugged them goodbye. They felt care for them. They thought that the police really were kind of the enemy. Like that's how confused their brains were. The brain, all it cares about is survival. So it will do all kinds of tricks and somersaults and crazy kinds of things in order to keep you safe. And so this is this is why the teaching of this type of these mechanisms and and how our brains work and how our psychology works and what we can do to better keep ourselves healthy and safe it's the most important thing for us to teach yeah just on the laws france seemed to be way ahead because they have in 2022 brought it in if domestic abuse is a prominent factor the perpetrator can expect up to 10 years in prison and 150 grand in fines if it leads to a, a woman's suicide or a woman taking her own life. These laws don't exist in Ireland or the UK. And France, again, are ahead with the workplace bullying where you can go to prison and you've hefty fines of up to 30 grand for workplace bullying. And who is it there so advanced and the rest of the world isn't even catching up because they haven't even looked into legislation? It's education, I suppose, again. But it's a really good question. I, I don't understand that either. I mean, I've been looking at the legislation here in Canada, and I cannot believe that since I was a girl, so that was in the 1980s when I was in high school, they, not a single law has changed. No regulatory structures have changed. No ways to keep children safer have been implemented in our school systems or in our sport organizations. So I mean, Canada is as behind as the UK. It's as behind as Ireland. It's not changing here. I mean, we should all be looking to friends and huh. saying, and really looking at the research around, is it helping? Are women safer? Are we seeing less women be hurt and less suicides in the female population? You know, I mean, all this kind of stuff needs to be measured. Yeah, because we're, we're approaching now. This probably won't go out to the new year, but we're coming up to Christmas when it's the saddest time and a lot of women die uh, in the home through violence around this time of year. And the UN even bring out their 16 days of violence against women and girls campaign to stop it and get more men talking about it. For example, the white ribbon campaigners, they get men to talk about it and stop this toxic masculinity. And to call out their friends when they, when they are, have been inappropriate. Well, you know, I really set off on this journey into looking at the brain science and trying to understand how bullying and abuse of all kinds is what is happening in the brain when we keep enacting this kind of broken record in our society. What, what was the catalyst? What started me on this path 10 years ago? was that 
and sorry for the language, everybody, but my son and other male students, so these were 15, 16 year olds, they were being called assing pussies. And they were being told that they were like yelled in their face, you're effing soft, you know, which is again, a, you know, a, a male insult, you know, you're not mm -hmm. hard, you're not erect, mm -hmm. you're not tough, you know. And um, I started to really look into that, looking into homophobia and misogyny. So imagine these are teenage boys. They're in their formative years where they're starting to sexually engage with girls. They're, they're starting to engage in romance and love. And, and, and it's this time where they're really developing a sense of their own selfhood and manhood. They're, they're developing a sense of their own virility and, and their relationship and their status amongst other men, especially the powerful men in their world, which is teachers and coaches. And these, these were teachers, registered teachers, but they were coaching basketball. So I really looked at the homophobia and the misogyny. And to remind everybody, misogyny means hatred of women. And um, if you think about it, the ultimate insult from the powerful men in your world is that you're like a woman. And there's this layer of kind of the swear word intensifies it. And there's this layer of disgust. How disgusting that you would be weak and soft and feminine and that's so um offensive and you're such a failure to be in that camp you know so so imagine the psyche of these boys that are developing well what do they think that they need to do to show that they are true men they're real men they need to prove it to the powerful humiliating cruel um, teachers in their world right they're learning that they need to somehow show something so they're not mistaken for these disgusting female anatomy, anatomy, you know, body parts, right? And so it makes sense to me that that young man, that boy, would become a man who acts out, you know, intimate partner violence because he has to show how virile he is. It, he's not doing it for his wife. He's not doing it for his partner. He's not doing it for his kids. He's still trapped. And let's go back into that notion of being trapped. He's trapped in this broken record relationship with the traumatizing adult male power figure in his life. He's proving to them what a man he really is. He has nothing to do. He has no empathy, no connection, no affection or love for this disgusting female symbolic figure. I mean, you know, we have to start putting two and two together. We can't keep talking about Oh, men do this. We have to say, why do men do this? Who is teaching them? What are the male role models that they have? How are they spoken to? How are they, how are their emotions regulated and taught? How, why are we seeing violence and not affection? Mm. Considering right. every human being on the planet was birthed by a woman, wouldn't you think everybody would be putting their hands under a woman's feet and really taking care of her and looking after her. And yet we have society, we have in some cases where a sense of entitlement where you can beat her, you can control her and do all sorts to her and have just no respect. Again, I mean, when you become somebody who's very, very controlling, very, very jealous, very um, manipulative. From my point of view, with the research that I look at, so I read the brain science research, that to me is a very traumatized brain. That man did not grow up in a healthy home. He probably, I mean, quite possible, does not have a good relationship with his mother or his father or his siblings, you know? And so these types of manifestations of really destructive behavior, they don't come from happy homes. They don't, it's a cycle. So if you grew up in a home that's very traumatizing, whether it's that your mother ignores you and neglects you and doesn't care about you, or she's cruel to you, or she always puts you down, she puts you down as a boy or a man because she hates men. I mean, it could be anything, right? Or you, or you are witness to domestic violence, um, watching your father treat your mother this way. All of these things script and shape, physically shape the brain. So really what we should be doing is if a man is displaying domestic violence, 
the first thing that needs to happen is he's stopped by the authorities. Going back to what you're saying about in France, they have strict laws. Perfect. Get stopped by the authorities, and then he should go straight into some sort of a facility where they do an EEG of his brain. And they take a look at it, and they start to understand, okay, he's got some uh, serious problems with his brain. Let's see how much how right women and children say. Let's see how much we can rehabilitate her or heal this brain. Because our brains are amazing at repair and recovery. It's going to cost society a fortune to put that guy in jail. It's going to save us a ton of money if we get his brain healthy again. It's worth a try. And I'm not saying all brains can be rehabilitated. And I don't want to make it seem like, oh, yeah, you go out and hurt your partner and then you get all this nice mental health treatment. I don't mean it like that. I just mean, can we open our minds up to doing things differently in society? Because right now it's not working. Right now we're losing 10 women a week, which is absolutely appalling. And so we need to figure out a different approach. And punishment is a downstream approach. I'm interested in looking upstream. How do we protect those boys when they're little? Where's the intervention? How come we don't know what's going on in families? How come when kids are bullying, going back to our conversation last week, when kids are bullying, they are waving a red flag that there's something wrong at home. They're not getting their emotional needs met. They're being abused potentially. They're suffering in some way and they're showing you mental illness at a very early age. That's where you intervene. You get the family support. You get them education. You get them mental health support. Whatever it takes. Because boys are born golden, just like our girls are born golden. But as Dr. Anda and Felitti have shown in their research, and this was the late 1990s, we turn that gold, these golden, beautiful babies, as you described, Anita, at the beginning, we turn them into lead. So <clears throat> I don't know if your audience knows this term, but back in the day, like in the medieval times, there was a kind of a belief system around alchemy. And the philosophers and the scientists, if you could, you can't call medieval scientists scientists, but those sort of philosophical people, they wanted to, they wanted to see if they could turn lead into gold. And um, people might remember it from Harry Potter because it was all about the philosopher's stone. Anyways, that's all about alchemy. Well, these doctors did research on close to 20,000 patients in the 1990s, and it's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And it's arguably one of the most important watershed medical reports ever done. And at the same time, I talk to people all the time. Nobody's ever heard of it. So I, as you know, I write about it in the book, in The Bully uh -huh. Brain. Um, and the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study looked at 10 different ways in which adults really harm children, whether, whether it's purposeful in abuse or inadvertently because the adult has their own problems. They're an alcoholic. They have mental illness. Uh, they get incarcerated, et cetera. And then five of them are abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, and physical neglect. These are the things that shape and structure and create incredibly destructive, unhappy, and chronically ill people in midlife. It's not their fault. It's that we have created a bullying society. It only gets worse because we're not addressing the bullying at an early age and not intervening and not getting families the help they need. If we did that, we would not only save billions of dollars in our healthcare system that pours out all this money for chronic illness in midlife, we'd also be removing the mental illness. We'd be really making a huge impact, positive impact on substance abuse. And yet we don't, we keep just doing this downstream damage control, put out the fires. No, let's go and take a look at how brains develop, how bodies develop, and let's keep our children golden all through their lives. Are we in danger then from abusers using this as an excuse on a cop out when, you know, it comes to, well, I have a mental health disorder or my brain isn't working like the way it should. Like lots of people come from broken homes or domestic violence and don't go on to do it. You just don't want it being used as a cop out either when they need to be held accountable. Because as it is, men are using their children as weapons against their wives, getting access to the kids when they've already, they've already been convicted of criminal offence, like battery. And we don't want to be going into a world where we're letting them away with it and spending all this money now. 
Yeah, I'd rather no, that's what the men are sells. Yeah, no, it's a very good, it's a very good point, and it's a big problem. I agree. You have to be very careful that you're not facilitating this type of yeah. thing, and you're not using it, as you say, as a a strategy to escape the law. What I think it has to be is a combination. So yeah. when when an individual is abusive, so if you look at my my son's teachers, for example. They were never held to account and it was all covered up. So for me, that's the most unhealthy. I think that if we're going to rehabilitate or try to rehabilitate a brain, it can only happen after the person has been held to account criminally. Okay. So if you want to hit your wife or your children, you need, a, you need a criminal accountability right there. Absolutely. But what would it be like if instead of just letting the person sit in a jail cell, we went about rehabilitation. We went Absolutely. About Absolutely. That's what yeah. I think. I think it's got to be, you want jails that are completely neuroscience informed. And yeah. you, want, you want these people, yeah, you have to put in your time and it has to be public and it has to be transparent and you have to be held account for what you've done. Absolutely. But you know what? We believe that we can help you and help you return to a healthier, better, more loving, more successful life. We're going to try. And if you fail and have to go back to jail, at least we tried. We tried yeah. to rehabilitate your brain. So, no, I fully agree with you. I, I, it was amazing to me. And I, I, now that I've been researching this for 10 years, I see it over and over and over again. The abusive individual is protected. Their reputation is protected. The system does everything they can to keep their perpetrator enabled and, and covered up. And they re-victimize the victim over and over and over again it's a very broken system and it's that's where i'm i'm pushing for change yeah because i attended a conference on friday and people that were at that conference work in law and they've been sexually abused in their job and bullied and these are people that take an oath to uphold the law and this is happening on their watch what well, chance have the rest of us got that don't work in law if this is allowed? I know it's it's true. I I've heard this yeah. in, in the medical in medical profession as well. They take their young doctors and they they treat them as if they're they're dirt. It's shocking. And these are our doctors. And they, just because they're young, and just because they have a huge amount of power over them, because they have to do a a practicum before they can practice medicine. The whole system is designed for these older doctors to bully the younger doctors, just like on our sport teams. We have older athletes that get to haze the younger athletes, even though we know that some of them die. We have the same hazing that goes on in our colleges and universities. The older students get to mistreat and humiliate and harm the younger students. And we even have it in the law. The, the established lawyers who have the power are able to sexually harass and abuse People that don't that need their, you know, perhaps they're an apprenticing lawyer, they're learning, or they're junior in the firm, or they're in a very male dominated firm and they're a female, or they come from a different culture or background, like a visible minority person. I mean, all it takes is a slight power imbalance. If we, and, and this is my point, Anita, we've all been raised in a society that's absolutely right. Everywhere you go, in the home, in your school, in your sport, in your church, and then in your profession. We live in a world that is so steeped in bullying that we can't even imagine another way. And I mean, that's what the bullied brain is all about. It's we've got to stop bullying our own brains right. and allowing, allowing this society to bully us. We, we can't be healthy if we do that. We have to change. And this is why, you know, I mean, it sounds melodramatic, but as you know, at the beginning of the book, I, I'm talking a revolution. We need a scientific revolution. We have to start making decisions based on brain health, not on we've always done it this way. Because we've always done it this way is producing mentally ill people who are either highly aggressive, highly reactive, they're totally victimized, they are in flight mode, they're frozen or paralyzed with anxiety. We're seeing this in younger and younger children. So it, it's time for a revolution. We've got to get educated about our brains. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so some of the women I spoke to, Jen, and, and some of the guys there that were bullied, it wasn't just women. Women had to deal with sexual harassment 
and bullying and the guys the bullying and they were worried about their career i understand it but these are people who know the law who are practicing law and are intimidated by people higher up or in a more powerful position and considering this month that she said movie has been released across the world on Harvey Weinstein and that story broke in 2017. You'd never imagine this is still going on in 2022. No, you wouldn't. But I mean, this is the problem. Just because Harvey Weinstein has been identified as a serial abuser, and they always are, it's not like they have one victim. As soon as you have a person who's victimizing people, and you can see in Harvey Weinstein's behavior, he's a really good example, actually, because you can see that his brain is what I would describe using sort of simple layman's terms, not what the neuroscientists would say. I would say that his brain is broken. So he has a broken record. It's like a script or a theater show he has to reenact over and over in his brain. Think of how unhealthy that man's brain is. And it doesn't mean he can't be a high functioning, really good producer, but it does mean that he has a default neural network in his brain that makes him act out a scenario over and over and over again that's abusive. So he goes to a hotel, he puts on the bathrobe, he wraps a towel around him, he invites a young person whose career he could advance or destroy. He's got the power. And as soon as you have these power imbalances, it sets up these kinds of scenarios. And, um, and so the woman comes and he says, literally, it's like he's reading a script. He says the same lines. Would you give me a massage? I mean, it's, and then he rapes people. I mean, it's incredible. So imagine being that person. He has incredible mental illness. But what we tend to do is we look at mental illness in the victim all the time. We're not as good at really identifying when someone behaves that way. Like if I was in a law office and somebody was bullying me, just like if I was a teacher or parent and I saw a child bullying, my first reaction would be to say to myself, that person is manifesting signs of mental illness. That's not great. Because somebody who's bullying you, who has power over you and can threaten your career, but then when they're dealing with a higher up, the person that has power over them, or they're dealing with clients, the people that they want to make money from, they put on a whole different persona. They're kind, they're articulate, they're lovely, they're fair, they're empathic. So you can see right there that the person has a split personality. They're Dr. Jekyll when they, when they want to be the good doctor or the talented producer or the, the excellent lawyer who contributes to the firm. And then you close the door and they become someone else. They become Mr. Hyde, who's destructive and harmful. And has to keep covering up this really, um, this cool behavior it has to be kept hidden. This harassing behavior, pressuring someone to do something they don't want to do because you have power over them. Living your life that way as a split personality is agony. So these people, if you look at the neuroscience, you might, you might diagnose them if you were a medical professional or a neuroscientific professional. I'm not, so I can't. But they would diagnose someone like that as having borderline personality disorder. So we need to what talk is about that? It's when you're Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, when you're a split personality, when you have one, one personality, the good doctor, or the pillar of the community, you're the best lawyer in the firm, and behind closed doors, you're a destructive individual. It's a split personality. And so they say borderline because the person knows what they're doing. It's not, it's not a complete like split where you're like one, you're one self that doesn't remember the other. And the reason they know this is the big indicator is the person will say to you, Oh, Anita, I had no idea that what I was doing was harmful to you. I thought we were flirting. I thought you liked it. I thought that, you know, we had something fun going on and you're saying, no, I've repeatedly told you to stop sexually harassing me. I don't like it. I, I feel intimidated by it. It makes me feel very uncomfortable. Don't do it. I've told you that multiple times. And they're like, oh, I had no idea it was hurting you. And then your reply to that, Anita, is then why do you only do it behind closed doors? Why don't you do it in front of our colleagues? Why don't you do it in front of our boss? So there's your borderline personality disorder. You're well aware that the behavior you do needs to be hidden. You close the door, then you do it. You get into the elevator yeah. and then you do it. Well, of course, if you're negotiating million dollar movies and deals, you have something about you 
and you're very coherent. And then to go behind closed doors and rape vulnerable actresses coming up along and the, that have no weight at all in the game. They're only starting out. Yep. It's, it's really, it's incredible. And, you know, I, these things came to me with the combination of the research. So reading all the psychology and the medicine, the neuroscience, but it also came to me very powerfully from a lived experience. And, you know, this is what you and I share is we've both being put through a really um, difficult situation. And in my case, that was exactly said. So the teachers that many students reported were abusing them. The teachers initially said, oh, we didn't know that it was hurting the students. It, we didn't know. And I believe that. I mean, I sort of thought, oh, well, that, that makes sense. My brain could say, oh, maybe they didn't know. Maybe they thought this was motivating this kind of abusive behavior. But then when I started to realize that they only do it behind closed doors, that they have a split personality, that they behave one way in front of, like I had never seen, these were my colleagues. I had never seen them ever swearing and screaming and raging and putting people down and humiliating them and using homophobic slurs and calling calling their colleagues retards. I'd never seen any of that behavior. That was all behind closed doors when they had power over children. So that's where you know you're dealing with somebody who's, and you know, these people, they, as you and I have been discussing, they don't come by this as a choice. And again, I'm not excusing them, but usually when you have that sort of split personality, borderline disordered behavior, as I've read in the neuroscience and as you know, I include in the book, it comes from an abusive home. When you're raised in that abusive environment and you have to align with the aggressor and you have to try and save yourself at the same time and you're the most power powerless person on the planet, you're a child, utterly dependent, you start to develop these mechanisms. You start to become, you know, and as you brought those statistics up, Anita, last week that were just brilliant, showing that a kid who's been brutally abused in childhood, who starts to bully other children as a way to relieve and act out this, this trauma that they're suffering at home or in sports or in school, they end up on the criminal justice path. They end up doing very destructive things, no matter how talented and smart they are. They can't yeah. manage their abuse. Can we talk about emotion, uh, emotion concept? It's in the book. And can you explain to the listeners what that is? and what the research behind it is. Well, so we have a tendency to think, and this is really, this is the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett. She's the leader and just an incredible neuroscientist and so articulate. And um, she talks about how we think that we are getting triggered by something in our world, but in actual fact, our brain at lightning speed is predicting. So it's going through the file folder in the head and saying, okay, what's the proper emotion concept to match with this situation? So let's say, let's say you told me that there had been a death in your family. But my brain, in, even, even as you're speaking, I'm, I'm taking in all the sense data of your facial expression, your eyes filled with tears. I'm, I'm noticing your voice is quavering. And my brain is a master at identifying all those signals. So it's whipping through the file folder in my brain which is constructed by my society and, and the family I was raised in and the school I went to. And it finds what's, what's the appropriate prediction for this type of a human situation. And it predicts sadness. So I feel sadness with you. You and me feel sad together. That is constructing an emotion concept. And we do it with everything. We do it so fast that we think we're actually getting triggered by the environment and we're reacting to it. We're not. We are predicting our own reality all the time by mashing it with emotion concepts. And they get constructed by society and culture and family. So imagine this scenario. You and me are working in a law firm and um, we have a boss who is the most charismatic, most charming. Everybody loves him, but he's sexually harassing me behind closed doors and he's promoting you. So he's playing us off each other. So in those scenarios, you want to have really complex emotion concepts. Our culture might have trained us to believe that people that are higher up, that have power and that are being aggressive and harassing and bullying and using sexuality as a way to do it, that our emotion concept response to that should be to feel terrified. I would argue that we will get better and healthier as a society when we start to develop more complex, nuanced, use better language. And this is what Lisa Feldman Barrett, our, 
argues. She says, we've got to have very complex and teach to children very complex emotion concepts and have a huge spectrum. So if my boss is treating me that way, I want to be strategic. I want to be aware that he's trying to make me feel fear. And as soon as the brain is afraid, it starts to make lots of mistakes because it can't concentrate. It starts to, you know, pour its resources into the amygdala. It's looking for threat detention um, or detection. It's developing this kind of, I mean, and then you can't practice the law. You can't problem solve. You lose your creativity. You stumble on your words because you're so afraid all the time. I don't want to have that emotion concept when my boss is treating me this way. I want to really think through strategically what are all the different emotion concepts that I can marshal in the situation because fear is going to be a stumbling block for me in my career. So I need to have, let's see, what could we come up with then? How, how else might you choose an emotion to predict what's the best way to handle a boss like that? Um, so the question is, you're asking me, what would I do if a boss is bullying me? If you've got a sexually harassing boss who could derail your career and your gut reaction or your instant prediction when this aggressive, awful behavior happens to feel afraid, give me another emotion concept that's going to serve you better. Um, would you call it out? No, because that's going to in my career. Okay, so that's an option though. And, and your brain can do that. It can predict, should I call him out on this? And then your brain goes... Risky, yeah. So what can you do? Or always have somebody with me. There you go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna create community around me. I'm gonna look for a buddy. I'm gonna always have a partner. I, when I grew up, my parents taught me not to go swimming without a buddy because it's dangerous. Being alone is very dangerous. One of the smartest ways you can overturn a sexually harassing person is to be never alone. That's smart. See how smart your brain is. And your brain is choosing. It's, it's really what mindfulness is in a sense. In mindfulness, what we do is we slow down our breathing and we create space between stimulus and response. The stimulus is sexual harassment. What's the response going to be? If we don't have mindfulness, if we're not being really strategic and smart and using our smart brain to choose what's the best prediction in the moment to these things, then we'll, we're going to make mistakes. Because the initial feeling you have when someone treats you that way is to feel afraid, right? But if you create mindfulness, deep breathing, space between stimulus and response, and the deep breathing is communicating to your brain that you're safe, because you don't want your brain to think that this guy is a predator, a social predator, which he is. But if your brain starts to feel that way, then it's going to go into a sympathetic nervous response system. It's gonna, you're going to start to sweat. Your heart rate's going to go up. You're going to start pumping oxygenated blood into your brain because you need to make sharp and clear distinctions and figure out how to fight the, the predator, how to run away from it, the flee, or how to free so it doesn't notice you. All of those things are not going to help you with your career. They're very deeply ingrained in our brains. And the sympathetic nervous system, as you and I talked about, when it keeps getting triggered over and over and over because you have to deal with the sexually harassing boss every day, it's incredibly unhealthy for your brain. It physically hurts your brain. It can be seen on a brain scan and it also hurts your body. It does all kinds of terrible things to the body because it's, you're pumping full of cortisol. So as an act of self-preservation and you're a lawyer or a solicitor, as you say in Ireland, if you're a solicitor and you're smart and educated and you come from a fabulous educated background, then be smart about this. Do not let anyone take your power away. And you just came up with a brilliant solution. I'm going to always be with my buddy. I'm never going to be alone because he can't do anything to me when there's someone else present. And then you might strategize around things like, should I report? What's the history of HR in my company? Do they support people or do they, do they actually make it more difficult for you, which lots of HR departments unfortunately end up doing? Um, that's another one of our broken society problems. Do you have a trustworthy hire a colleague that you can get some advice from or report to and say this is an untenable situation and you know i mean there's lots and lots of options that you can't let fear happen because fear will make you feel as we talked about before like in a domestic abuse situation fear makes you think that you are you are helpless and it mm -hmm. makes you think if you try and escape you're going to get hurt more and it, it gives you the perception of inescapability and this is where things like anxiety and depression and, you know, then all of a sudden they flip it and they make it seem like it's your problem. Oh, you have, you, you're mentally ill. You've got issues, you know, and this is in time. I love the way they dyslect with that. 
Johnson. Exactly. So bring it back to you when they're actually the one with the mental health problems. Exactly. But, you know, we don't talk very much about aggressors and how they have their manifesting mental illness when they behave that way. You don't mm-hmm. hear that nearly as much as you hear people talking about what's the diagnosis for someone who's the victim. Oh, they have anxiety. They have depression. They have borderline personality disorder. They have all these different things. It's like, okay, that's great. What does the aggressor, what does the perpetrator have? I'm not hearing a lot of diagnoses about that person. Yeah. No, you don't. Just on the emotion concepts on the women that are dying and taking their own lives after getting out of domestic abuse, because in some cases with this that the coroner found was that they had escaped, but the fear was still there. That fear was still there and their brain didn't go to that place where I suppose they didn't ever think they'd ever be free from it. Well, I mean, that's a very extreme form of perception of inescapability where you always feel under threat. One of the research projects that's being done, it was done in the UK, actually, a research, a neuroscientist studied the brains of violent defenders and murderers. So they did brain scans on these, and it was men. They did brain scans on these men in a high security prison. And what they found was, and this is what you would see in a woman's brain who's full of fear all the time she would have an enlar- likely have an enlarged amygdala. So these murderers had enlarged amygdalas. So you say to yourself, well, just a second, if they're the perpetrator and the aggressor, why is their threat detection system sort of full of, of brain resources? Well, how, how come the brain is pouring so much into the threat detection system? And if you think about it, if you've become someone who's violent and murdering and reactive, who flies off the handle and does violent things, again, they've not come from a stable, happy, healthy home, school, or sport organization, right? They've been so threatened so many times that they have developed hypervigilance. So they have this kind of enlarged part of the brain. Same thing with a woman who's been under so much threat, so much anxiety, she's developed hypervigilance. She know, her brain no longer knows how to calm itself down and how to change that, how to take that energy away from the amygdala and pour it back into other brain resources like empathy and compassion and mathematics and problem solving in this second language, right? Our brains, and I mean, when, I, when we separate out these, an aspect of the brain like the amygdala, it's quite artificial. It's the way lay people talk about the brain because that's, it helps us with a vocabulary and understanding. Neuroscientists know that the whole brain is always working simultaneously in an incredibly complex network. It's like so complex, it's unbelievable. So when we separate out amygdala and we look at it on a brain scan, we talk about it in that way. It's only a partial understanding of the complexity of the whole thing. But the bottom line is the key takeaway from this is for these women, is they need to know that their brain believes what they inform it about. If you've been um, hurt a bunch of times and you're terrified, your brain doesn't know that the predator isn't there in the moment. It can't distinguish between you thinking about the predator and imagining the predator and it actually being there. And this is, again, where mindfulness is one of your superpowers. Because when you, when you do the slow breathing, when you calm down, when you clear your mind, and when you take time to be in the present, you're not thinking about the past and how terrifying it was and how much he hurt you and how he broke your heart and how your children were hurt. That's the past. In mindfulness, you're doing the slow breathing and you're, you're in the present moment and you're telling your brain, essentially, I'm safe. I'm safe right now. We have a future ahead of us together of all kinds of different things. Let's just be together in this moment. We're safe. There's no predator. And I mean, this is the way in which you get these very um, reactive, hyper, you know, hypervigilant neural networks to calm down and be present. Because if you keep telling your brain by remembering the trauma, by thinking about it, you keep sending your brain back, it keeps thinking you're in danger again. So it's, it's ramping up your whole system, pumping adrenaline pumping cortisol, it's getting you ready to run away. Well, 
you've got to stop doing that. That's up to you. And that's, and as you know, in the book, I have all kinds of exercises where I get people to, you know, these are the kinds of applicable things we can do as laymen based on the neuroscience. They have lots of evidence-based practices for us to get our brain back to organic brain health. Yeah. So it's just all about unlearning and undoing all that fear that you've built up over the years. And rightly so, to protect yourself and keep yourself safe and your children. Exactly. And I love the way you put that because, you know, I really feel like people need to be friends with their brain. They need to thank their brain. You know, the brain is working double time to keep you safe. And if it uses the sympathetic nervous system, the, the fight, flight, and freeze system, well, you should be thankful because it's, its whole goal is to make sure you're the safest person out there. So yeah. But you have to be the one to say to your brain, you know, close your eyes, do your mindfulness breathing, be in the present moment and say to your brain, thank you. I know that you are working hard to keep me safe. I can assure you right now that the Marine is fully in charge and you can step down and relax and rest and do all the things you're good at. You can do problem solving and creativity and, and social emotional connection and all those things and raise your children. Um, you're so good at that brain, but I don't need you to protect me right now because the mind's in charge. And there's no predator. And the more, and it sounds a bit silly, I guess, but the more you do that, the more you understand that you have this incredible, you know, survival thing in your head and you start to tell it that, that it's okay, it can step down and be, be relaxed. You're creating a lot more health for, the, for your body and for your brain. And I get all that. And I know from working through it for a year on myself, but I also understand the fear that's in these women and that they feel so stuck and it's, they can't see a way out. It's impossible. And I suppose that does come back to education again. And I was one of the lucky ones that fell into, because I went and I was researching stuff and I found you and you helped me with it. And then I got the book and practiced and practiced and practiced. I had the time. I was home. I wasn't working. And I had the time to do all that. But I do get how those women, and it's just so sad. And it was a really last resort. And I know how people feel and how desperate they are and lonely and broken. And actually, one of the doctors at the other day at the conference, um, she said that the bullying it can be irreparable and that how dare you hurt or how dare you break another human being. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. You know, you've said so many things that I want to respond to. First of all, I want to acknowledge an important thing you said, which is that it takes time to get better. You know, we live in a society that's so much about quick fixes and the brain's not a quick fix. You have to work hard at it, just as you described. You set yourself a program, you started to educate yourself, and you put in the hours needed to get yourself healthy and well again and get your brain back to top performance. Yes. And I was lucky because I had the support of my husband and I didn't have to go out and get another job. And I had the full support. And then I was surrounded by really strong and great women as well and my male friends. And that, here's your community again. Mm -hmm. Community is everything. The brain is deeply, deeply social. So these women that have been traumatized in this way, I would love to see them creating strong communities of male friends and female friends and co-parenting together and taking care of each other and, and changing this, this maybe outdated family model where You've got, you know, the man and the woman and the two children. Why does it have to be that way? Back in, in ancient times, they had, and, and other societies still have much better family structures than we do. And they call it allo parenting. And allo parenting is like daycare, or it's like when your grandma is taking care of your kids or, or your next door neighbor, and you have her kids on Monday and, and your friend Jake has the kids on Friday and takes them on an outing. And it's when parents are working together to care for children and you have community. So the key take, it takes time to heal the brain. I would gently, carefully disagree with the doctor that you can repair a broken brain. You absolutely can, maybe not all brains, but we have neuroplasticity until the day we die. 
And neuroplasticity means we can change our brains. And we change our brain by the environments we're in and by what we practice. So I want your listeners to be so empowered to understand that if they feel broken, it's up to them to start the repair. Because the brain is, it's absolutely innately wired to repair and recover, just like our body is. You break a bone, as long as you go and see a medical professional and you get a proper cast put on and you immobilize it and give it the six to eight weeks to heal and you, you let it be safe and so on, it gets better. Our bones can mend. So can yeah. our brain. I think she meant uh, the fact that, you know, you lose trust and it takes, it, it's just, yeah, you have, to, you have to build it all up from scratch again because what you believed was good people are good people and what you believed uh, was happening to you and you're gaslit and told it isn't happening to you. So I think she, what she meant is that some of that damage is trust building it all back up again. And of course, we can all do that. We can, and it's incredibly hard. And, you know, what she's saying and what she would observe in her patients would be, you know, exactly that. I mean, it's, it's absolutely devastating. And an important piece in this is what I keep thinking of when you're talking is my son told us later when all the kids had spoken up, you know, there was <clears throat> many students who spoke up about the abuse. He said, you know, I had set myself one goal for the year, just one goal. And the goal was not to let them break me. Yeah. And our, you know, this is a 16 year old boy. And I was like, wow. So let's go back to emotion concepts because at a 16 years old, he recognized he was dealing with social predators. He didn't have the language to communicate. He was being abused. He didn't have the education or knowledge. We never tell kids, you know, 99.9% .9 of your teachers are amazing and they're going to do everything they can to help you advance in life. But there's going to be that 1%. It's dangerous. They're a social predator and they'll do everything they can to destroy you. And you've got to watch out for them. You can't let them gaslight you. You can't show them any vulnerability. They're dangerous. We don't tell kids that because we're, we're so protective of teachers, basically. But, you know, our son came up with an emotion concept for the situation, and that was rebellion. I will not let them break me. I will watch them and watch what they do, and I won't let them in my head. And even if it means I have to sacrifice my sport, which is the thing I love the most on the planet, he did sacrifice his sport, but he didn't let them break him. And this is what we want for our women. You know, we need them not to be worrying about the white dress so much and the flowers and reading the romance novels and watching rom-com on TV. No, that's producing a bunch of really inaccurate and dangerous emotion concepts because they're going out with an emotion filing cabinet that doesn't have a lot of capacity for, he just punched, you know, a hole in the plaster beside my head. And... You know, like the brain gets so confused by that because the brain was, it was in the romance with this man. It was the honeymoon phase that they talk about in abuse. This is exactly what psychopaths do. They, they put a, they put on a psychopath fictional face and they reflect back to you everything that you want to believe that you're the most beautiful woman in the world and they adore you and you found your soulmate and just imagine all the romance language that we've had hammered into us. Fairy tale, oh, sleeping beauty, you name it. Girls are taught that stuff from an early age. They are not taught what to do when a man does a threatening behavior like that. And it escalates. So the second you see any violent tendencies, you have any emotional abuse. You know, if your partner, your spouse, male or female is putting you down, that's a red flag. You're in a bad relationship shouldn't be happening and if you don't address it right away then it escalates this is what our young women need to learn they need to learn to have complex emotion concepts for negative situations even if their culture hasn't taught them they would be wise to develop them themselves you know yeah i i do believe it starts and uh, less of the fairy tales more of and you don't want them not having a nice childhood but you want them to see there is danger out there and if we go keep feeding them the wrong information they're just going to carry it through whereas if we educate them and from the bully in the yard that we don't have the abuse of husbands partners later on well and you can see how the brain gets so confused you know um oftentimes when people are abusive they want you to believe that it's you know the mythologies that we have in our culture it's for your own good Alice Miller, the psychiatrist, identified that whole concept in the 1980s. She called it poisonous ped pedagogy, pedagogy being teaching, poisonous teaching. In other words, I'm hitting you and it's for your own good. I'm going to teach you discipline. I'm going to teach you how to be tough. 
That's why I'm hurting you, small child, when I'm a big, huge adult that has all the power and you're completely dependent on me. It's not good for kids. It's not good for their brains. It's well documented in science that it does nothing but harm to the brain. So, but, you know, we have these outdated beliefs and outdated practices. That's why, you know, I'm on such a mission to, to try and educate people about what the neuroscientists know and the psychologists and the doctors. They know so much about our brains. Well, when you have, as the statistic that we started off at one in four women would be abused, that's, if you have four friends, there's one of your friends is in an abusive relationship and they need help. That's a lot of women. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's a cycle. I mean, as, as we've talked about before, hurt brains hurt. They are hurting on the inside. They hurt other people. They hurt the people closest to them, their wife and children or husband and children. You know, they hurt their colleagues. It's just awful. But if you have a hurt brain and your, your option is, yeah, I'm going to go out and hurt other people with my broken brain. Or I'm going to repair it. I'm going to recover. I'm going to fight to have an unbroken, super healthy, high functioning brain. There's lots of science out there telling me how to do it. Why not try? And thank you again, Jen. That was brilliant. Was Um, I look forward to catching up next week with you and um, where we'll be talking more of the bullied brain. Thank you, Jen. Bye, Anita. Thank you for joining us on the Femcast. We invite you now to stay connected with us by hitting the subscribe buttons below and follow us across our social media channels at the Femcast. We value your feedback and reviews. By sharing ideas, insights and experiences, we can all learn, grow and make a meaningful difference. We also want to remind you that we care about your well-being. If any topics discussed on today's episode have raised concerns or you need support, please visit our website www.defemcast.com for helpful resources and phone numbers. Thank you for being part of the Femcast.